Good afternoon, my name is Tony Bedford and I am going to discuss my current research that has been conducted for my dissertation towards my BA Honours degree in Advanced Skin Techniques. My topic is related to sun awareness, more specifically an educational intervention which focuses on risk to appearance to improve sun protection behaviours within teenagers. A preliminary literature review found that melanoma, a form of skin cancer, was the second leading cause of cancer in adolescents and young adults. In the majority of cases, we know this to be preventative. From an educational stance, Skeller 2003 found that sun protection habits needed to be promoted in early life and then reinforced during adolescence when independence increases and these habits are less prominent. To reflect this, various charities and organisations have focused on incorporating sun awareness into primary education and creating policies to support this. However, this is not yet the case for secondary education. Secondary research has shown that although adolescents are more likely to be aware of the health risks associated with sun exposure, they are less likely to engage with positive sun protection attitudes. As a result, teenagers are not benefiting from what we call a 360 sun protection strategy. This involves using an SPF of 30 or above on days where the UV index is at least 3, seeking shade between the peak hours of 10am and 4pm, wearing protective clothing, a hat and sunglasses. Soraya 2004 suggested an intervention which changed attitudes towards the perceived healthiness and attractiveness of having a tan. Therefore, my research aims to investigate the potential risks of an appearance-focused educational intervention to raise awareness of the long-term risks of UV damage with the intention of increasing positive sun protection attitudes and subsequent behaviours. This was done by evaluating the associated risk to skin damage in relation to ultraviolet radiation. And then I looked at the subsequent effects on age groups. Secondly, I investigated current sun protection habits and attitudes amongst 18 and 19 year olds. And then finally, I critically analysed existing educational sun awareness approaches and constructed primary research to further develop an existing educational approach. So for the methodology, three pieces of primary research were conducted to fully achieve the same. Firstly, a cross-sectional online survey was conducted with participants aged 18 and 19 years old. This was used to identify existing attitudes and behaviours of adolescents in relation to sun exposure. Secondary researchers found that health-based interventions were not as effective on adolescents as they needed to be able to personally relate to the information they were given. Adolescents were associating the signs of ageing or photoaging with future behaviours and being older. Various studies have explored the risk to appearance intervention, however one in particular was used to base my workshop on. And as you can see the questions are absolutely identical between primary one and primary two. The difference being an intervention was placed in the middle of those questions for primary two. The reason that this has been done is to be able to compare the answers of future intentions with regards to using sun protection methods. Primary two should allow us to see if that intervention has made any change to the current attitudes and behaviours of adolescents. Primary three was to relate this research and make it relevant within a secondary educational environment. Therefore I was looking for key themes by using open-ended questions looking for themes to do with health, appearance and policy. So the next few slides are from the workshop that I created and I've taken an existing image which clearly shows um, UV rays A, B and C which I'm sure we're all familiar with and how they penetrate at different levels of our skin and then to the left I put some terminology which was familiar 
to the cohort that I delivered this to and it was explaining how UVB compromises our barrier function and leaves us vulnerable to the elements, external elements and then the UVB penetrates further down and it causes that skin to burn and in response UVA stimulates that melanogenesis which is that production of melanin in that colour and that indicates that we've been damaged, that we've had that DNA damage there. And then even further down into the skin, into our dermal layer, um, the UVA stimulates that formation of free radicals, um, which causes that breakdown of collagen and elastin. And that causes the appearance of sagging, those wrinkles, everything that we associate with that aging process. So another study looked at um, the use of a woods lamp within the clinic and these are images that I used within my workshop which because I think it's a very clear message as to the impact that sun can have on our skin. So if you have a look at this image, this is of an American truck driver of 28 years and on the left side where he's been exposed to that UV, even if he's had the window up you can still be exposed to that UV he's accumulated a lot more damage and you can see that breakdown of that collagen and elastin. On the right hand side is the skin shown underneath a woods lamp which is what we use in clinic to see underlying UV damage and other skin conditions. And if you have a look at this image all of these little dark marks here are UV damage. And it can take up to 10 years for this damage to show on the, sur on the surface. And as you can see, this person in the image is quite young. Um, so it's understandable why adolescents and young people would not be concerned when they're not seeing that damage straight away. A lower woods lamp is an excellent way of showing a participant underlying damage which has already occurred it's not always the most accessible and it often would require somebody who is able to um, decipher those images and is able to understand what each colour means as they are different colours which appear underneath the woods lamp um, and that is why I've chosen to focus my workshop on a study by Brinker and this was a team of German scientists who used an algorithm to create um, photo aging software which is available within an app and it allows you to take a photo and photo age your appearance taking into consideration different factors whether that be the use of an SPF, sun, using a sunbed and using different periods of time so 5, 10 and 15 years. Now it is important to note that this isn't always 100% accurate however because it has been used within a study for appearance based interventions um, it was you know it was possible to say that this could have an, a really positive impact so for participants who for one reason or another were unable to use this app I gave an example of myself when I trialled it and as you can see the different factors that have been applied um, with five years, no sun protection um, and weekly tanning. You can see it's quite realistic and therefore I was confident that this would be able to help participants personally relate. So the analysis of the findings is still ongoing. However, this is just a demonstration of the kind of comparisons that are being made between the two primary research methods. As you can see from the cross-sectional survey, the responses that were received were incredibly varied in comparison to the workshop. Now, as you can see, the intention to use SPF within the next six months was varied, and that reflected the existing use of SPF within participants. It is worth noting, noting as well that the concern with premature ageing linked to sun damage was also varied and other data from the findings suggested that 75, well at least 75 participants were unsure if UV, um, ultraviolet radiation 
contributed towards the development of wrinkles. And this was the theme throughout the survey, was that the benefit, the attitudes towards sun benefit and sun risk were varied. However, participants were aware of the health implications of UV exposure. However, there was more uncertainty with regards to um, the impact of UV on appearance. There were also varying degrees of interest in relation to appearance and sun tanning. If you have a look at the workshop results, this was from a cohort um, of level three beauty students from another college. Now, we wanted this to represent the general population and therefore the lowest level of education was selected with the most 18 and 19 year old participants. And the intention of this was to find participants with hopefully a similar knowledge in relation to UV exposure and this did happen to be the case. Within this cohort, the existing use of SPF was incredibly low. However, the interest in appearance and that um, strong desire to have a tan was high. The attitudes um, towards tanning were positive. And as you can see post-intervention, the intention to use the SPF within the next six months was higher than the existing use of SPF. The concerns linked to premature aging, linked to sun damage, were also higher. And this, ref this is a complete contrast to the baseline results where there was a low SPF, but a higher intention to tan. Um, so it can be concluded that this research would have been incredibly beneficial however there have been limitations to it with regards to the fact that this workshop was only able to be delivered remotely and it was intended to be delivered in person also within the workshop five participants did not um, respond to the second survey and therefore this may have slightly altered the results post intervention whether that be higher or slightly lower it's also worth noting that um, the months that the participants were asked to recall, some of them were winter months and also um, we were under COVID restrictions. So the intention to sunbathe may have been higher if we had not been under COVID restrictions and also if this study had been conducted over more spring and summer months. So going forward, I would advise that a longitudinal study within spring and summer months and a larger cohort would be more beneficial because we'd be able to measure the effects of this intervention and see if it was affecting that behavioural long term and seeing if it was having any long lasting changes. So upon personal reflection, there have been challenges with regards to the planning of this research, um, as ethically we are not allowed to have participants under the age of 18, and this didn't necessarily reflect the original research. So in order to make this as organic as possible, the age cohort was limited to 18 and 19 year olds. And that is why a semi-structured interview was conducted with the deputy head teacher of a secondary school in order to identify if this kind of intervention would be useful within that educational setting. And it was also to establish um, the kinds of behaviour and attitudes towards health and appearance. And if there were any existing educational policies in relation to sun protection, like there have been in primary school and also with regards to COVID restrictions this workshop was originally intended to be delivered in a classroom environment and therefore it had to be um, changed to be delivered remotely so that did require additional time and problem solving however it has been incredibly rewarding there's been that potential to contribute towards existing research and sun awareness education. And as I have a vested interest in teaching, 
it's given me that experience of creating an educational workshop and used to public speaking because I'm not the most um, natural of public speakers. However, I do hope that this additional research and planning will contribute towards the grade that I'm aiming for. And this topic is certainly something that I would take forward if I was considering a PhD, as I do feel that there is a lot of potential to expand um, that education and that educational workshop. So yes, thank you. Thank you for your time in listening to my research. And if you do have any questions in relation to the study, then my email will be included at the bottom of this reference list. However, that is all for today and again, thank you very much.